Now before we open up this abdomen, I just want to show you the external abdominal oblique muscle and its extent. So it's coming from about the fifth rib all the way back to all the ribs and we see here it also has some lumbar attachments and then it's gonna have fibers going primarily in the caudoventral direction and then we can see here it has a quite broad aponeurosis that it will then attach to the linea alba the pubis via the prepubic tendon and all the way up to the tuber cocci okay and the caudal border of that portion that attaches on the tuber cocci and the pectin of the pubis, there's going to be a free edge of that aponeurosis that we know as the inguinal ligament. Okay, We can see now right here, kind of in the fold of the flank, a nice large lymph node. So this lymph node here is the subiliac lymph node. Sometimes you'll hear it called the prefemoral lymph node. Okay, so now we're going to open this up. So now I've cut along the origin of the external abdominal oblique and reflected it. And we can see now this muscle here going in a cranial ventral direction is the internal abdominal oblique. And you can see its aponeurosis is coming down here to fuse with the aponeurosis of the external abdominal oblique. And then we can even see without even cutting that muscle, we can see the transverse abdominus muscle here. And then if we reflect up this way, we can see the rectus abdominus muscle passing to the prepubic tendon which is basically its aponeurosis of insertion upon the pubis. So now I've transected the internal abdominal oblique. A little bit's up here, a little bit up here. And we can see that transverse abdominus muscle very nicely here. And we can see these spinal nerves that are running. These are the medial branches of the ventral branch. And we also have a, a lateral branch of the ventral branch up here. And most likely, because this is the last rib, this is probably a branch of spinal nerve T13 and then L1 and L2 would be up here. But without going all the way back up to the vertebra, it's really hard to, to tell. But most likely, I would say that was... T13, L1, and then L2 is up here. Okay, so when we open up the left side of the animal, there's our external abdominal oblique, our internal, and our transverse abdominus. We've also cut away the ribs here that we could reflect it and detach the diaphragm. Okay, so now we can see that extent of the diaphragm cranially. And we see that this left abdominal cavity is pretty much filled with the rumen and there's the reticulum there right up against the diaphragm. Notice the position of the reticulum and the heart. Okay, So that's why hardware disease which is traumatic reticulopericarditis can occur where if especially with cattle they'll eat pieces of metal and stuff and they'll they may poke through and get to the pericardium. Okay, so reticulum, rumen, here we have the spleen, and down here we can see a little bit of the abomasum. We notice here that along the left longitudinal groove of the rumen is attaching the superficial leaf of the greater omentum. Okay. Now if we pull this out a little bit, we can maybe see that in the goat, the dorsal caudal blind sac is not as prominent, although the ventral is still very prominent down here. 
but it's covered with the superficial leaf of the greater omentum at this point. Okay? So really that's about all we're going to see except up here we do see a kidney. Okay? So the kidney in the ruminant on the left side is it's dangling. Okay? They still consider it retroperitoneal, but you see it dangles because that allows when that rumen gets full that it gets pushed over to the right side. Okay? So let's go look at the other side. So over on the left side here, say once again our external abdominal oblique. I didn't mention before that this very thick outer surface, this connective tissue surface, is actually elastic fiber connective tissue. And that's the abdominal tunic, also called the tunica flavia abdominis which helps hold in the abdominal contents, allows stretching but gives support to hold it in. So we have the external abdominal oblique. We then have our internal abdominal oblique here. It's kind of thin and funky in the goat. Its aponeurosis fuses with the aponeurosis of the external, which then creates the superficial rectal sheath going superficial to the rectus abdominis. And then we have our transverse abdominis muscle who's with its aponeurosis is going to make our deep rectal sheath over our transverse abdominis muscle here. Okay? So we reflect those all out of the way. And in the adult ruminant, if we did a, a right paralumbar incision, the only loop of bowel we'd see would be this descending duodenum here. Okay, and here's the caudal flexure of that descending duodenum. Okay, so we have mesoduodenum and greater omentum. This is the superficial leaf of the greater omentum. So remember, the superficial leaf started on the opposite side, on the left longitudinal groove of the rumen. Okay. And those longitudinal grooves divide the rumen into a dorsal and a ventral portion. Okay, then it comes looping all the way around, and we still see it here superficially. As that omentum goes around the caudal groove of the rumen, it then, on the right side, along the right longitudinal groove, becomes the deep leaf. So that deep leaf is going to attach onto the rumen on the right longitudinal groove, okay? So it's created kind of a sling here, and above that sling is the supraomental recess, and this is where most of the intestinal mass is present at, okay? So those both come together, and then they swoop around, and they create a sling that attach to that descending duodenum and then up to the body wall. Okay, so if we pull this out like this, this is the deep leaf here and this is the superficial leaf. And let's see if I can pull those apart. See, I can pull them apart like this. And that space between them is going to be the omental bursa. Okay? Now if we reflect the rib cage, we see that in the adult ruminant that liver is totally underneath that rib cage and the diaphragm. Okay. Now because the rumen as it grows bigger it pushes the liver to the right side, the left lobes of that liver rotate ventrally. So our left lobe is ventral the falciform ligament, if it were present here, we would see it right about here, separating the left from the quadrate lobe. Then the quadrate lobe is separated by the gallbladder from the right lobes. Okay? And these landmarks are very important because we really don't have that lobation we saw in the dog. Okay? This caudalmost portion here that's attaching to the body wall via a triangular ligament 
and this caudate process, that's all part of the caudate lobe. Okay? So, if we reflect that like this, we see that the descending duodenum is coming down here. And it's got this sigmoid flexure in it. That's just something <laughs> that the goat has. Okay? So, this is all descending duodenum. And we can see here the pancreas within the mesoduodenum. And if we separate it here, we can see a little hole opening, I think it's right here, between the caudate lobe and that mesoduodenum. And that is the epiploic foramen, which goes into that omental bursa. Okay. Down here, we can see the duodenum is coming from the abomasum, which is the true stomach. Okay, we saw a little bit on the other side, but most of it is here sitting on the ventral body wall. So this is the abomasum. Notice that greater omentum, just like it attaches to the greater curvature of the stomach in the dog, it's going to attach to the greater curvature of the abomasum in the ruminant. Okay, now Coming off the lesser curvature, going to the liver, we have a mesentery. And just like in the dog, this mesentery from the lesser curvature to the liver is going to be the lesser omentum. Deep to that right here is going to be where the omasum is at. Okay, so omasum, abomasum, right up here is our reticulum. On the other side was our rumen. Okay. So that's the liver. Let's see, up here we can also see in the renal depression of the liver, we can see the kidney, hence renal depression. Okay, so once again, pancreas, we got descending duodenum, descending duodenum, turns and goes cranial as the ascending duodenum. We're not going to see where that becomes jejunum. But it does. Now if we reflect, carefully reflect this greater omentum, which surgically that's what you're going to have to do is gently reflect it because you don't want to tear it. We have all this intestinal mass here. Okay, So the jejunum is going to wind and wind and wind. And it's coming along here. And as it winds along, jejunum, jejunum, we see some lymph nodes here. These are going to be the mesenteric lymph nodes. And then we have this kind of elongated part. This is known as the jejunal phalange. Okay, this is a good landmark for surgeons because that tells them we're getting close to the ilium. And here's the ilium. Okay. In the dog, we use the anti-mesenteric ileal artery to define the ileum. We don't have that in our large animal. So we use this mesentery going between the ileum and the cecum. So we have our blind sac, the cecum here. And so that's the ileocecal fold or ligament. Okay. So that helps us define our ileum. Now our ileum comes up and it's going to go basically at about the junction of the cecum and the ascending colon. The first part of that ascending colon has kind of an S-shaped structure here, which is the proximal loop. Okay, that proximal loop is going to come around here, and we can see it coming around, and then it goes into our spiral colon. Okay, first part of that spiral colon spins inward, and so that's going to be our centripetal coils. Remember your physics, okay? And then it's going to turn around and spin back outward as the centrifugal coil. That last part of that coil, we're going to see coming out here. So we see that last part of the coil running right along side of the jejunum here. Okay. Now between it and the first coil, the centripetal coil, 
is where we're going to find those mesenteric lymph nodes. Okay, so those lymph nodes are between that last centrifugal coil and the first centripetal coil. Okay, and then we'll have a distal loop, which I'm not sure we'll be able to see it here, but the distal loop will then come cranial, and it's just in fat up in this area up in here. It's going to go from right to left, because we always have to go right to left with our transverse colon, and it's going to be cranial to the root of the mesentery, and then it's going to become our descending colon which is what we see coming down in all this fat right here. That's the descending colon. Okay? And so that was the course of ingesta. Let's see, anything else I want to show you here? And I think that's all we can see until we take all this stuff out. Okay? See if I can get this back under here. Okay, so just a quick review of the omentum. Remember our greater omentum, we saw the superficial leaf attaching to the left longitudinal groove of the rumen. As it comes around the caudal groove, it then becomes the deep leaf as it goes along the right longitudinal groove of the rumen. Okay, so it's going to sweep like this. The superficial always stays superficial. The deep is going to be this deep layer. The space in between them is the omental bursa. This space above the omentum in this little sling is going to be supraomental recess. That supraomental recess is where all the other intestines play. Okay, so they're playing at recess. Okay, so I think that's all I can show you on this guy as we see him now.